Hi, I'm Kevin Barrett of Truth Jihad Radio. If I hadn't jumped on board the 9-11 Truth Train in 2004, and then gotten railroaded by politicians in 2006, I'd probably be working in some university teaching subjects related to Sufism. So I hope you'll forgive me when I occasionally revert to my earlier interests and bring on Sufi guests like Charles Upton in my previous interview and Wahid Azal in this one. Some of the world's most important thinkers have been Sufis, people like Al-Ghazali and Ibn al-Arabi. The poetry, literature, and music inspired by Sufism is also quite impressive. So check it out, learn something, enjoy. And if you like offbeat, truth-seeking radio, toss a few bucks in my begging bowl by way of the PayPal button at truthjihad.com or the subscribe button at Patreon, where I am, Dr. Kevin Barrett at patreon.com. Welcome back. This is the second hour of tonight's Truth Jihad Radio. I'm Kevin Barrett. Considering the coronavirus crisis from Islamic perspectives, I'm blessed to have on uh, two of the most interesting thinkers from a Sufi perspective tonight. Uh, We just talked with Charles Upton, author of A Sufi Response to the Coronavirus, and now uh, another very interesting Sufi gentleman and scholar Wahid Azal is with us. He is the author of a bunch of very interesting papers over at academia.com. And one of them that got my attention was headline Shills, Spooks, and Sufis in Service of Empire. It's critiquing the Mariamia Sufi order. And some of those people in that particular order are big players in the traditionalist movement, which is what got my attention originally and led me to end up... Uh, coming to Islam. And I still have mixed feelings about some of those people, uh, including Syed Hussein Nasser, the uh, the eminent professor at, I think, George Washington University. And uh, I love the study Quran that these guys put out. It's one of the best intros to the Quran in English. But let's face it, their politics is weird and their their practices are weird. And if you say anything about them, they'll try and sue you. Or at least so it appears (laughs) from reading Wahid Azal's paper. So let's talk about that and whatever else. Hey, welcome, Wahid Azal. How are you? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, dear Dr. Kevin Baird. How are you? I'm very well. Well, alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's, it's good to make your acquaintance. <laughs> so, likewise, likewise. So the, the world is, is spinning out of control as usual. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and here we are, Suf, uh, you know, anybody who's, who's gotten interested in the Sufi side of Islam, I suppose, has learned that, uh, you know, giving up control is not always an entirely a bad thing. In fact, submitting to God is the ultimate giving up in control. And that's what Islam means, right? That's exactly what it's on. I mean, submission to the will of the All High. Um, during this whole coronavirus, or as I call it, the cor- Corona apocalypse, um, I think um, one sobering thought by people who are believers is to consider the fact that throughout biblical as well as Quranic literature, plagues are always the, the province of the All High. It's God who sends the plagues upon humanity. Um, so, you know, the way I look at this whole Corona apocalypse is that, um, it is true that governments all around this planet are taking the opportunity to, you know, basically claw a lot of power into their hands. Um, but let us be a little bit mindful of the fact that synchronous events are not always, uh, the causality of the event, uh, that the causality of an of event may actually occur on another level. Entirely, despite the reactions that governments uh, are, uh, you know, are having towards this coronavirus, um, because I think there's a silver lining, and the silver lining is that more and more people, uh, people that one didn't expect, are beginning to understand certain home truths that people like yourself and others have been talking about for decades now, um, and I think this is providing one of the best opportunities uh, for almost a global awakening that we have ever had even, I think, transcending the Second World War, because there were pockets of the world uh, during the Second World War that were not impacted by the actual fighting. Uh, but this affects everybody, man, woman, and child from the North to the South Poles. Yeah, well, I was thinking of comparing it to 9-11, which, of course, that, that's been the issue that got me on my current trajectory. Uh, and, and a key fact about 9-11 that I like to cite 
is that according to research cited in Martha Stout's book, The Paranoia Switch, about half the American population was, uh, got, got clinical PTSD from watching those images on television. So the shock to the global nervous system, which actually made the random number generators go haywire, there's, you know, the psi researchers noticed that, you know, a few hours before 9-11 happened, even the night before it started, but it turned into the random number generators all just went completely haywire right up to 9-11. You know, they went crazy right before it happened. Uh, and so it was a shock to the global psychic nervous system in a way that nothing else has been. You know, I argued that the only similar, the only event that shocked the global nervous system that much before 9-11 was the crucifixion. And that took many centuries to have its shock, you know, gradually play out, whereas 9-11 happened almost instantaneously. And in a sense, I think 9-11 maybe was an act of antichrist. I suppose the crucifixion was as well. Um, and so here we have the global nervous system shocked even more so because when 9-11 happened, everybody outside the USA may have been shocked, but they weren't so shocked and just made like U.S. Americans typically were that they would come down with clinical PTSD from watching television. Uh, but now the whole world is, is locked up and staying home. So it's, it's, it's gone yeah. beyond 9-11. I would also probably say the Kennedy assassination, 1963. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is another one of those uh, punctuated moments of history that, that yeah. changed things. Well, why yeah. does Antichrist yeah. want to shock people so much? Well, um, let's look at it from this perspective. There's a saying that the devil is the ape of God. Um, and um, from the Quranic perspective, uh, the devil is actually ultimately the servant of the Almighty. Um, and there's a saying by the Sufis, the more antinomian Sufis like Ahmad Ghazali, who say things like, you know, those who have not learned the science of Tawhid at the feet of the devil are mushriks, are associators. So, you know, we have to look at this from two perspectives. The perspective is that the shock the system by the system of the Antichrist, uh, a term that uh, uh, Charles Upton coined in, in one of his first books, is apropos. But the system of the Antichrist has no independent existence of its own in, in the universal stream of existence, which is which is God. Um, and, you know. There's a term in there's a saying in alchemy, and this occurs in Arabic texts as well as Latin texts of alchemy, which say that the poison is the gift. So this coronavirus being the poison, as it's said, because it's a pandemic, uh, in a sense, is also propelling a large section of humanity, of the thinking humanity, into thinking about issues that they otherwise wouldn't have thought about before. Um, and that is that, you know, even after this passes, we still have to deal with the next 20, 30 years of a possible environmental apocalypse on this planet, uh, where there, you know, environmental scientists are speculating that there could possibly be a system shutdown of, of all we've known uh, as the environment. So, you know, this has gotten people thinking. Uh, in a sense, it is also because everything is in luck, and it has also allowed the Earth itself to breathe. Um, and I would encourage people to think beyond just merely the human realm itself. I mean, we live on this planet. We think we are the acme of it all. Um, so this anthropocentrism of humans thinking all in, only about themselves needs to change. We have also have to recognize that there are other beings created by the Almighty living on this earth, animals, plants, bacteriological life forms, etc., which we, have, we as a species have made a mighty mess of on this planet. And the Quran is very specific. In saying that, you know, the, the, uh, the position of Khalifatullah, the vice on earth, which is bestowed upon humans, is incumbent on humans taking care of the earth, which we haven't been doing. So the earth, you know, fights back. And, you know, one of these things is such a thing as the coronavirus and probably others. Well, this is a good time of year to be aware of the web of life that goes so far beyond uh, human beings in the, in the springtime. Yeah everything's coming back to life and these Quranic verse, verses about how the, uh, the, you know, Allah sends the rain that brings the dead earth back to life uh, are extra relevant here where I live. Of course, it's not the desert of Arabia. So the way the rain brings the dead earth back to life is in the springtime. 
and Buddy is a man. Beside Nursi, I wrote some beautiful things about that. You know, how could you look at these flowers blossoming and the you know insects coming out and 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 things turning green in the springtime and not uh, be directly aware of the existence of God? Exactly. Exactly. And so we're exactly. all we're all holed up in the springtime. <laughs> uh, well, well, not, not here at the Antipodes. I mean, I mean, I'm uh, south of the equator, so it's about we're in fall right now. It's the autumn oh. here. Yeah, I'd forgotten. I so say you're in Australia now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Australia, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I guess the the majority of the population is 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 experiencing the springtime and uh and you Aussies are experiencing the fall after experiencing some apocalyptic fires, I understand. Speaking of apocalyptic oh phenomena. Oh yeah. Yeah. Apocalyptic, yeah. They think about five hundred million animals all up uh, may have died as a result of these bushfires. Oh my goodness. Last year. Wow. Yeah. Huh. That's a... Uh, that's it's terrible and terrifying <laughs> to to think about. Um, very so, so so let's talk a little bit about uh, about uh, Sufism. You're you're a uh, I guess a, a founder of the Fatimiyya Sufi order. Maybe you could tell us what that means. <laughs> how did you become a founder of of this order? And how did you get interested in Sufism in the first place? Sure. I had an interest in Sufism um, probably beginning in my late teens. And uh, as a result of certain experiences, I was led uh, to my teacher, uh, a, a Iranian sheikh um, who held three ijazas or licenses from three separate orders. Uh, one sub-branch of the Nimatullahi order, uh, a sub-branch of the Ghadari order, and um, the Khaksar Jalali order. These are all Iranian orders. And he visited the United States in 1992, and, um, you know, we hit it off, and he didn't have any of his marids with him at the time, his disciples. And uh, within a year, um, he accepted me as a disciple. Um, unfortunately, he was ill uh, with cancer, so we didn't have a uh, long time together, only about six years. And um, before he passed on, he um, gave out uh, Ijazza to three of his disciples, uh, me amongst them. Uh, not so much as his successor, but to carry on the work in, in, a, in a new wrapping, as it were. And with me, he, you know, he instructed me that after a certain time, uh, when the time was right and when I felt uh, confident in my own development, that I should find, found a new order. Uh, and so this occurred in stages, in, you know, beginning in 2002 and then 2005. Um, and so here we are. We're a small group of people. We are primary uh, focus is um, the the person of Fatima, uh, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, and to we explore the mysteries of the divine feminine from that prism. So in that sense, we're somewhat similar uh, in in some of the later doctrine of the Maryamiya. But um, uh, and we're quite open about the fact that we you know we kind of describe ourselves as post-Islamic in the sense that um, most of our doctrine. Uh, comes from the wellspring of the teachings of the Bayan. Uh, this was the, the creed founded in, in the 1840s by Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shirazi the Bab, um, and his successor, Sofa Azal, the dawn of pre-eternity. Uh, so this is, which is basically a sort of a botany version of Twelver Shiism, or an extremely esoteric version of Twelver Shiism. So we are very much Shiite. Um, and, so you're, you're not uh, Baha'i though, because everybody thinks of the Baha'i when they hear about the Baha'i. No, 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 no. Either, either, when, a, or when they hear a, about the Bob, they, they, they think of the, uh, the, the, what's it called? The, uh, the church of the, uh, well, the, the, that Bob, J.R. Bob Dobbs guy. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. The Baha'is are basically a schism, um, of Bobism. Uh, Bobism was just like, 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 for example, some of the Nizari Ismailis in the medieval period, uh, the ones in Alamut who declared the resurrection in 1165. Um, the Bobby doctrine is very similar to that botany Ismaili doctrine, except rather than coming from that stream of Ismailism, it emerges out of 12 or Shia. The Baha'i subsequently split off and then did their own thing um, and um, completely whitewashed the esoteric doctrine and the metaphysics out of it completely. And as also, as well, uh, much of the, the, the social justice teachings within the teachings of the Bayah. Um and um, subsequently aligned themselves with first the Tsarist, then the British Empire, and then uh, the Americans and the Zionists. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that's your, your critique of the uh, the Miriamia 
and people like Said Hussein Nasser is is precisely yeah. that they uh, they kind of went over to the side of the empire. Yes, and this happened very early on with Nas. This was going on. One could argue probably from the time that he left the United States and came back to Iran in the 1950s, um, because almost immediately when he returns to Iran from uh, from Harvard and then MIT, um, he is co-opted within the system of the Pahlavi regime. Uh, and that was because of his family connections. Um, his father, for example, is, has been rumored for a very long time to have been one of the presidents of the Anjumana Ochovat, which was a kind of a Sufi Masonic organization that was founded in the, uh, during the Constitutional Revolution, um, that during the Pahlavi area was mainly composed of army officers, uh, and some of the, um, the liberal aristocracy of Tehran, the leftovers from the Qajar period. Um, then, in the 1970s, he was appointed uh, the secretary of the office of Farah Pahlavi, uh, the queen of Iran uh, of the time. And uh, then, you know, subsequently, when the revolution happened or as it broke out, um, many people don't know this, but the, the infamous speech of the Shah that occurs in December uh, 1978, where he uh, claims to have heard the voice of his people, was actually written by Sayyid Hussein Nas. He was the, the author of that uh, speech of the Shah. So, so he um, inadvertently one, helped trigger the uh, the revolution. Well, he he totally weakened. Uh, you know, I mean, he basically destroyed the credibility of of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi as a result of that. Oh, well, maybe but once, maybe Allah will forgive him for his sins uh, just for yeah. that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but once once uh, the regime collapses in February of 1979, he um, I think about March or April, uh, he leaves Iran himself incognito and comes first to Britain and then settles in the United States in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, during this, you know, the period of the 80s and the 90s and then leading up into the noughties and the current decade, um, Sayyid Hossein Nas and his son, Vali Reza Nas, uh, become basically fixtures within the neoconservative establishment in the United States. And, and that's kind of mind-boggling because, of course, the, the neocons are the architects of 9-11, which created this tidal wave of Islamophobia and thinking that, you know, Said exactly. Hussein Nasser, this guy who's, you know, on the surface, he appears to be the best possible PR spokesperson for uh, for Islam that you could ever find. You know, many of his books would be ones sure. I would happily hand to people who didn't know much about Islam. And as I said, the study Quran Same. is is magnificent. It's it's a great thing to hand to anybody who wants to find out what the Quran really says, but doesn't speak Arabic. Um, so how, how could the guy who's uh, doing this wonderful um, dawah for Islam be the same guy who's working with the people who just smeared Islam with this uh, demonic uh, human sacrifice on 9-11? Well, I would, I would say very easy explanation. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And words and deeds in a person's life must accord. I mean, people, a lot of people say a lot of lovely things, um, but their actions speak otherwise. Um, and whether we're talking about intellectuals or politicians, this has always been the story of humanity, you know. So, you know, the struggle, you know, even as the, as the text of the Quran, uh, constantly, there's a refrain in it. You know, the whole point of the exercise is to make your deeds and words accord, to align these two, not to be a public intellectual to say one thing and do another thing. I mean, in Iran, um, during the, you know, the last few years of the Shah's regime, um, it has now come out, thanks to WikiLeaks, uh, that Sayyid Hossein Nas was actually informing on Iranian dissidents in the United States uh, to the CIA through the embassy at the time, Richard Helms. Uh, wow, the no, no, there, there's a there's a nasty Helms, character. Ambassador of Iran. Yeah. yeah, he was the ambassador of Iran at the time. Uh, left this post just before the eve of the revolution, and all these WikiLeaks cables that have now come out showed that uh, Nas was in regular contact with Helms and also Henry Kissinger. Um, and he was ratting on Iranian dissidents in the uh, United States, uh, one of whom was Reza Barahani, um, who was uh, a sharp critic of the Shah at the time. And uh, now it turns out that the CIA, on the prodding of NASA, had put him under surveillance. Hmm. Yeah, well, my Iranian friends, obviously, <laughs> who are very much from the pro-revolution camp, uh, would be quite disgusted with that. I know that they have some differences of opinion with Nasser on his approach to Islam, but I haven't really gotten into this uh, this spy stuff with them. Maybe I can talk to some of uh, some of. Those. I'm actually hoping to do a, a radio show with uh, with uh, an Iranian. 
what uh, expert and somebody who can explain the thinking of the uh, kind of the guardians of the Islamic revolution over there real soon. So maybe I'll bring that up and, and we'll see what, what he thinks about that. Uh, so y- y- your, your take on this then is, is that uh, we have to align our words and our deeds. So, so Sufism involves a kind of a purification of the heart, polishing the mirror of the heart. So it perfectly reflects reality and reality with a capital R is God. And yes. so when people start, falling into, you know, two-facedness and, you know, not aligning their words and their deeds and, and then putting up with, with liars. And, and again, a, a, a neoconservative, uh, either uh, you're ignorant if you're hanging out with neoconservatives um, and you don't know what they're really all about, or you're a liar because the neoconservatives are basically philosophers who believe in systematically lying. They believe the truth is so dangerous it yes. should never be spoken in the public sphere. They believe that Socrates deserved to be crucified uh, or killed, I guess, for telling the truth in the public square. That's the basis of their whole philosophy. They believe they are the superior beings who have not only the right but the duty to lie to the multitude and project the images on the platonic cave wall to hypnotize the masses. Oh. This is their basic belief system. And so if, if you're a believer in Islam and truth, and, and then the kind of stronger version of it, which is what Sufism is supposed to be, how could you be hanging out with neocons? That's the question, isn't it? But you just remember, I mean, these sorts of tensions have also existed throughout Islamic history. I mean, Hafiz, in his poetry, in, in several places, criticizes you know, those Sufis, you know, who, uh, you know, dress up as Sufis, but then seek court patronage from kings and potentates of the day. So this has been going on, you know, throughout that history. I mean, we, it's, it's nothing recent, but, you know, because this is close to our own time and, you know, we know that the neocons are actually Satanists, uh, um, you know, for someone like Sayyid Hussein Nat, you know, who says one thing to do another thing, um, I mean, this is very dis, you know, disheartening, but, you know, I would say that his books, his intellectual, production uh, stands on its own merits that one shouldn't diss the guy for, for his intellectual uh, production. And, you know, I keep recommending Nasser's book to all kinds of people still, but one has to be careful in, in putting the guy on a pedestal. And this is, this is a problem that unfortunately uh, seems to exist in a lot of these sorts so-called organizations where the individual is placed on a pedestal, a cult of personality is made out of the individual rather than the message. Let's stick to the message. The in- individuals can always be flawed. Individuals make mistakes. Individuals are constantly being tested by the Almighty. And the closer that you walk a path such, such as this, the more you are going to be tested. You're not uh, immune to to testing from your eye. Well, that cult of personality seems to creep into Sufism a lot. Uh, and it's it's yes. kind of ironic, isn't it? A basis of Sufism is annihilating the ego or the, the nafs. And so if you annihilate your ego, theoretically, you, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, playing power games and things like that. But it seems that the, the way Sufism is structured lends itself to some of this, that, you know, the way that ever since the early days, I guess in the earliest days, people went and studied with Sufi masters and learned what they had to learn and didn't, you know, swear a specific allegiance to a particular tariqa or a particular sheikh. But today, you know, it seems like the, the kind that survived involves this teaching that you should submit to your authoritarian sheikh the way a corpse would submit to the hands of its yeah. washer. And so That's that means just yeah. totally giving yourself up, not to God, but to your sheikh. And you're supposedly God's going to work through the sheikh. But like you said, everybody's being tested. Maybe the sheikh's being tested and being tempted. And the sheikh is, is being yeah. tested yeah. more than others. You know, yeah. um, look, a lot of the Shia Gnostics, a lot of the Shia mystics, you know, people like Mullah Sadra, uh, et cetera, um, are also quite unequivocal that um, in these sorts of authoritarian tarifa situation, these mashayef, these sheikhs are actually supplanting uh, the function of the hidden imam. And so, you know, you know, so what he recommends, it, it says that it behooves the Shia Gnostics to do their saluk, to do their mystical wavering with the hidden imam himself, you know, so that, that they experience the parousia of the imam, the return of the imam, the appearance of the imam within themselves, even in the time of Kaiba. Uh, so this is one of the doctrines uh, of, of Shia mysticism. Uh, and that is why, you know, in the Hosea environment, you've had, uh, you know, this whole development over the last 300 years of various fogaha, various jura consulates, uh, you know, after they finish their studies in law, then, then they branch out 
uh, into the study, both the practical and the theoretical study of mysticism and gnosis. The Ayatollah Khomeini being one of the prime examples of this, uh, who was the most eminent commentator of both Ibn Arabi as well as Mullah Sadra and, and those schools in the Hosa, in the seminary. And, and nobody seems to know that, at least at the popular level here in the United States. Everybody thinks of uh, Imam Khomeini as being some kind of um, fundamentalist, sort of the equivalent of a Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, he was the exact polar opposite and a, a true intellectual. I think that maybe yeah. we are uh, in, in the West, we, we white men, uh, we're, we're underestimating Iran's leadership. Well, that's true. I mean, there's a book that just came out by um, this Ohio State University scholar, Leila Chamancha, she's an Iranian woman, um, where she basically lays out that, that the entire concept of the guardianship of the jurisprudence and Khomeini's understanding of the whole concept of Ulaya and Walaya uh, comes directly from Ibn Arabi. Um, and she's explored this um, in about three, four hundred pages of text. I can send you a copy of this later if you want. Um, yeah, it's it's a that. very worthwhile study for people to look at, and also that it wasn't just even concentrated to even Arabi alone. That that, that that Ayatollah Khomeini was taking from many different mystical sources, you know, to build this political theory of, of the Wilayat al fatih I mean, I I personally don't adhere to the doctrine of the guardianship of the jurisprudence. I have immense respect for for both Ayatollah Khomeini and his successor Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, but you know. Yeah, what you just said, that, that equating the Iranian leadership and the system of, of Iran with Wahhabism is, is a great mistake. These are two completely different things and are animated by totally different things. I think part of the reason that Iran has become the arch enemy and Saudi Arabia has been sort of weaponized as a, as a tool to you know, keep, basically get things done for the empire is that Iran does have this much more sophisticated leadership that could actually yeah. be providing a model for the rest of the Islamic world. Now, you said you don't uh, adhere to Walayat al faqih the guardianship of the jurist, which is the political philosophy underlying the Islamic Republic. But would you agree with me that the basic concept, in, the, in a fairly loose and flexible way, has a lot of promise for uh, Islamic polities in general, not necessarily just Iran, not necessarily just Shia Islamic ones. And that's probably the reason that there has been this very ferocious containment strategy practiced against the Islamic Republic ever since the revolution. Well, no, no question about that. And, you know, had there not been sanctioned, had there not been these 40 years of, of uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, circling Iran, you know, and trying to force it into submission, um, had Iran allowed to be developed naturally without any interference, I mean, um, I think a lot of the things that even the critics of the system in Iran uh, say about the system currently would have not occurred. Um, but as a model for a system, I mean, yeah, we can, you know, I mean, like I said, I don't necessarily agree with it, but it is a model, of course, it is a model. Um, can it be made better? Of course it can, you know, but compared to some of the other systems, in the region, it is far more democratic. It's far more democratic than Saudi Arabia, any of the Gulf countries, and arguably even Turkey under the current Erdogan regime. So quick question. What, so what political system would you agree with? Uh, you know, I'm going to have uh, uh, Peter Simpson. On none, the show. Of the existing, none of the existing political systems. I think, you know, we as a, as a species are coming to a point that we have to start thinking novelly in, in, in terms of hybridization. Um, because what we have done up to this point doesn't seem to have worked. And we've met a ma major mess of this planet. Um, one thing, for example, that I start with is I believe in eco-socialism. Um, so one of the ordinances of the Bayan is that the four elements should not be bought or sold, should not be uh, commodified and commercialized. So a, a polity that begins on this basic principle um, where it is collectivized, the four elements, air, fire, fire water, and earth. Um, this, and this is a basis to begin a political discussion. Um, looking at the earth as sacred, um, and not defiling the earth. So in, in essence, you know, embodying a political system where humanity becomes the Khalifatullah, the, the, the vicegerent of God on earth, collectively. Very interesting. Uh, so do you, you know, eco-socialism, it sounds sort of like what 
we're hearing from the Democrats these days with Bernie Sanders being the socialist and then some of the others uh, pushing the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is good, but obviously it doesn't go far enough. You know, I mean, from, from my perspective, you know, I, I believe this system of capitalism must be dismantled. If, if, if we as a species and other species here or symbiotes with humanity are to survive, um, then we need to dismantle the system. We must be environmentally uh, conscious. You know, we must understand that there are processes, organic processes on these planets that if we upset, um, it will blow back onto us as well as it is now. Um, and people need to take this stuff more seriously. Children need to be taught from a young age to respect the, the, the earth, um, you know, to see plants, animals. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to use a kumbaya analogy, but to see them as, as you know, as as the other, but as the other that is us, you know, that we are we are connected to these species. Uh, so kind of like the indigenous perspective on animals, plants, and what have you. Mm-hmm. And how do we get there from here? Because where we are here is is kind of a long way from that, it seems to me. I, I've often wondered whether the Western sort of hatred of nature, uh, this pave the earth philosophy that's led to yep. just a huge economic boom um, as we move matter around on the surface of this planet in this frenzied way, moving way more matter around and reshaping it than we really need to. But we're just going nuts doing that. And maybe we're doing that partly because in Christianity, there's this idea that the exactly. world is fallen, the creation is fallen. And so we, we hate nature and, you know, we hate everything natural. And that's why European Western culture is so neurotic, uh, you know, so, so, you know, has this loathing of nature. And that's maybe why we're, we're paving the earth. And so how, how would we get past that? I always thought maybe Islam had part of the answer, which is getting past that idea of the, um, the, uh, the, the fall and the, the idea of a, of a fallen world and a radically imperfect creation. <laughs> well, this is a very quick question. Um, first of all, I would bracket that by saying that not all Christian denominations look at the natural world as the enemy. Um, Orthodox Christians actually have prayers uh, for the safety and the upkeep of, of, of the environment. Um, and, er, you know, the Catholics, early Catholics did as well. Where things go kind of off the rails in the West is with the introduction of this whole uh, prosperity theology that, that you know, uh, emerges out of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so Calvinism, Lutheranism contributed to this idea uh, that nature is the enemy of man. Um, so, for example, you often hear from evangelical Christians, you know, that this refrain that, you know, nature is the, is the domain of the Antichrist, is the domain of Satan. Uh, but this perspective is a, is singularly Protestant. It is not uh, shared by all other Christian denominations. Um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the church father, the desert fathers adored nature and they, you know, they, their writings from some of these early church fathers where they say, you know, that nature is the locus of the theophanies of God. You know, that you can get closer to Christ, closer to the Father through nature. But then with Protestantism. And then St. Francis uh, too, of course. Yeah, St. Francis of Assisi is a perfect example of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I would suggest that where we get to there is that there needs to be an interrogation of uh, some of this insidious ideology that came out of the Protestant Reformation. I mean, there are certain good things that came out of it. Uh, but there were other bad things that came out of it as well, such as this uh, prosperity theology that now in America, North America, generally has the imagination of all of these evangelicals or neocons, too. I might add that. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they kind of it's, it's, they, they meet and mix in weird ways, don't they? Like Mike Pence is very close to neocons. He, uh, he was look, awfully close to the anthrax perpetrators, uh, quite suspicious, yep. but he's supposedly evangelical. Yep. And I, who, what was it? The attorney general under Bush, uh, what's his name from Missouri? Um, that, that he was all, and there are a bunch of these guys like that, these, these, you know, Christian neocons, which should be a contradiction in terms. Yeah. Christian neocons, Christian Zionists, you know, I mean, how does that even work? Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, this is, this is the <laughs> thing, you know, they, um, this is what I call the, 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 you know, the, the manifestation of the paradox of Satanism, where these, you know, completely contradictory things are joined into a single ideology. Well, well speaking, uh, speaking it, of, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to say, speaking of the contradictory things joined the single ideology, I noticed in your biography that you sent me, you said you've got your own political theory of theophanocracy, where Karl Marx yeah, meets Ibn Arabi. <laughs> so how did <Yes>. that work? <laughs> well, basically, um, theophanocracy means rule by theophanies. Um, and the philosophy of Ibn Arabi believes that all of existence is nothing more than the manifestation of the theophanies of the names and attributes of the al High. So everything is, is the manifestation of one of the names and attributes. And, you know, if we take the next step and bring this, you know, ecological consciousness into the, into the mix, then a political system where human beings and everything around us is a manifestation of the names of attributes of God is a dynamic place to start by building a true democratic order rather than the liberal democratic order um, that wanted to begin from the cult of reason um, that doesn't understand things like theophany and, and the, the, you know, the manifestation of the reality capital R into this world. Um, so just like the Imam Khomeini, you know, I'm also, you know, calling from uh, the wellsprings of the writings of Ibn Arabi uh, to, to reach some conclusions politically. Now where Karl Marx comes into this, well, Karl Marx um, to this day, is probably the most important critic of capitalism that has ever emerged in the West. And whether one agrees with him or disagrees with him, his analysis, at least in the first volume of Das Kapital, is very much still relevant. And in fact, right now, more than ever, um, we don't have to agree with his conclusions, but we still need to take his critique aboard and also his dialectical methodology. Um, I don't agree with dialectical materialism because I think it's very straight jacketed to put all events, uh, you know, uh, moving within the course of the material world. Nevertheless, the dialectical metho- methodology itself is extremely important. Um, and if we look at then the unfolding of reality through a dialectical prism, then we, we ourselves as individuals have a better way of interacting, as it were, with the spirit on a, on a daily basis through this, this dialectical perspective. Wow. Well, that's, that's interesting because in a way I would have thought sort of Marx and Ibn Arabi would be at the exact polar extreme opposites of thought in that, as you say, Ibn Arabi comes up with this, uh, the world of, uh, the, the, he calls it Alam al Mithal and, and then the, uh, the imaginal world. That is, he believes yeah. in the reality of these, uh, yes. areas, you know, it's actually, a, in some ways, it's a neo, it's like a neoplatonic cosmology where God is this ultimate <laughs> unity that everything's coming out of this ultimate unity, which is God. And closer to God is the angelic realm. And then a little further out yeah. maybe is the, the realm of fire with the jinn beings. And then there's the cold, dark, damp, uh, material world that we inhabit. And Ibn al Arabi, like so many other people who are on the idealism side of philosophy, would say that the area up towards God is more real, and God is the only thing that's absolutely real with a capital R. And then around God is the angelic realm, which is more real than the jinn realm of fire, which is more real than the cold, dark, damp material realm that we inhabit. And so even though Arabi is saying that this material world is really not where it's at, and that everything that happens here in the material world is actually being generated from these higher realms closer to God, and ultimately coming from God. Sure. And whereas Karl Marx is the exact opposite. Is it? Karl Marx is saying everything is just coming from the material realm. There is no God. There are no high, higher levels. And that what's driving history is this matter moving itself around on the planet in these, you know, if, if he'd been a little more Darwinian in this, you know, life uh, evolving in a Darwinian fashion. And all of that has, has produced this, these material phenomena. And that's what really drives history. And we get lost in these fuzzy ideas like even Arabi's and we miss the reality that it's the material realm that's creating everything. So in a sense, these two guys are extreme opposites normally. And, and you're, you're putting them yeah. right together. <laughs> yeah. Except that Marx never could actually explain the teleos of, of the material movement of, of history. Whereas one of the greatest disciples of Ibn Arabi, namely Mullah Sadra actually resolved this problem with his theory of transubstantial motion. You know, that uh, substance is in a constant, you know, process of being perfected without ever actually attaining its total, total perfection, because the to- total perfection is the reality itself. Um, so there are ways of bridging these gaps. Like I said, we don't have to agree with everything that Karl Marx says, uh, but there are golden nuggets within a lot of the things that, that he says that we should take aboard. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, what, one of the things that I think 
very much resonates with the Quranic message in, in the overall philosophy of Karl Marx. And we have it in, in, in the first ayah uh, of the fourth surah of the Quran, where God says that humanity is created of one soul and then separated into, you know, genders and then tribes and, and people, etc. So this oneness of the human creation and the equality that, uh, that is suggested from that passage is very much present in, in the philosophy of Karl Marx. Indeed. But the, the, I think, as I recall, the, the two Quranic reasons given for God having created us in different tribes and groups are one, to compete in goodness and two, to get to yes. know each other. Exactly. Yeah. But with, with Marx, the competition isn't exactly competing in goodness. Uh, it's competing no. just sheerly for wealth and power, isn't it? It is. And this is, I think, where Marx's own analysis of the situation in front of him may have been erroneous. That if he perhaps had been adept of any tradition, maybe he would have seen it from a little higher perspective than, than that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, to go write an alternative history novel where uh, Karl Marx, you know, runs into a Sufi sheikh. <laughs> Might make an interesting story. Uh, <laughs> how would history well, I, be I different? Call, call, I call Marx the red sheikh, you know, the, uh, the uh, sheikh al-Ahmad. Well, he's got you the know, beard. Kind of a, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So we have to be able to engage. We have to be able to engage with all of these ideas, even if these ideas are contradictory on the face of things. Um, I think the intellectual project of any thinking person is to then insert themselves to bring these, you know, logical contradictions and rather than even making them paradoxes, um, align the discussion. So there's a discourse, a trans historical discourse happening between a great Andalusian Sufi sheikh and a great German social theorist and political economist. Yeah, it's a, it, bringing those things together is is uh, you know, such a challenge. One of the reasons I love Dostoevsky is that you know he had had elements of both, and you know there's a, a strong you know conflict or dialectic uh, between these revolutionary forces or these you know these these young uh, upend the old system kinds of ideas, including socialist ideas that were brewing in Russia in the mid 19th century, and this uh, Christian mysticism that he found that's rooted in, in Orthodox Christianity. And I think it's the conflict there that creates the tension that gives it so yes. much energy. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's a great novel, by the way, uh, especially his brother's Karamazov. That is, um, I read that the first time I was about 14 years old and I kept going back to it for a long time. Yeah. I it's just went back and read novel. that too a couple, few months ago. And I'm reading the, uh, uh, the idiot right now. We, I haven't read that uh, for like 40 years. And <laughs> I'm finding a lot, a lot of, uh, wonderful, crazy new stuff in it now. Um, and I think there's, there's a Sufi element to the idiot, right? He's kind of, he's, he's a oh, yeah. bit of a holy fool. Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah. But that seems to be also a trope in Russian literature. I mean, you find this in, in several different versions and various different, uh, Chekhov has a version of this himself. Uh, the idiot. And then, of course, you know, uh, an idiot, a malevolent idiot, then shows up in the Tsarist court in the form of Rasputin. (laughs) (laughs) Right. The unholy fool. (laughs) The unholy fool, yeah. 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 Well, and that leads to another aspect of Sufism that's that's interesting, is the uh, that, that complete letting go in which Sufis accentuate the idea of Islam is surrender to God and they surrender their egos and surrender themselves to God. So in such a, an intensified fashion that sometimes they seem a bit crazy. And so there is this trope of the, the dervish, the word darwish in Arabic and probably Persian too, I would imagine other cognate languages there probably, you know, it, it signifies a crazy person as well as a Sufi mystic. And, you know, we see all kinds of examples of this in, in, you know, in Morocco, there's a, a national poet called the, um, uh, the Majdub. And then, you know, Layla and Majnun is the great, you know, the great Sufi love epic that inspired Eric Clapton's Layla. And Majnun means crazy guy, right? He's <laughs> so there's this, this yeah. whole, uh, discourse on Sufism that seems to link the exalted states associated with, uh, Sufi mysticism with madness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, word, to what extent, Darvish, yes. the, the word Darvish is actually a, a Persian, a Pahlavi word. 
Um, and it's, it's actually three words, uh, dar veyash, in himself or in herself. So it, it denotes interiority. Um, the crazy dervish is actually the kalandar, you know, the, the left hand path, the one who defies all authority and even, uh, you know, the authority of a sheikh of a tariqa. Uh, and the perfect exemplar that we have in, in, you know, in, in this, uh, Sufi sacred universe is obviously Shams of Tabriz, you know, the, the, the Sufi that finally made uh, Rumi go nuts, you know, this uh, great figure of the city of Konya, you know, well respected by uh, the uh, Seljuk Sultan K. Kobad. Suddenly this disheveled dervish from Tabriz, you know, shows up in Konya and uh, Rumi completely loses it and uh, cannot bear to part company with his great Sufi, Palantar. Right. And then writes a lot of great poetry. <laughs> Write some amazing, some of the greatest poetry ever written. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and I noticed when I was studying Sufism in Morocco and, uh, you know, hanging around with Sufis, although I was hanging around not with the really wild and crazy Sufis, you know, the, the guys who stick the knives through their tongues and, and other parts of their bodies and it doesn't bleed and that shows that it's a miracle from Allah and things like that. There are all kinds of stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. I was hanging around with, with some very, very sober Sufis. In fact, they're so darn sober <laughs> that they're kind of the establishment in Morocco now, the Bucci Shia order. Uh, it's kind of the paradigm of establishment Sufism plugged into the all the whole power structure in Morocco. But that's just who I fell in with over there by, uh, by the grace of Allah. <laughs> I stumbled upon them. So that's who I hung out with. And, uh, you know, the, the sober Sufis like that, uh, and some, some of whom do end up maybe compromised with power elites, uh, seem like a, you know, kind of polar opposites really from, from this, uh, you know, the, the Darwish calendar side of it, that it all kind of coexists and, and these, you know, the, these groups kind of, you know, encounter each other in their orbits. It's a, it's a very interesting parallel universe, the Sufi parallel universe. Well, we, we, we call it the eternal tension between, uh, the, the paradigm of Halaj and the paradigm of Junaid. Um, and this was, uh, you know, if people don't have a reference point in, in about the 10th century back that there were two different strains and two different masters. One was Junaid al-Baghdadi, a very sober Sufi plugged into the Abbasid establishment of his time. Then there was Mansura Hallaj, this completely disheveled, uh, you know, Galandar that, um, had some amazing metaphysical ideas and also claimed to be, you know, God, you know, he said, Ana al-Haq, I am the real. Um, and so this, this is the tension within the Sufi world. It is between Halaj and Junaid. And this trajectory follows basically everything, you know, in, in the world of Sufis. But even the sober Sufis are, they're, if hoping to, if, if, well, if they're actual Sufis, I guess it's, if you're a, you're a Mutasawa, if you're studying to be a Sufi, but once you're an actual Sufi, you would be experiencing those, uh, drunken, as it were, inner ecstatic states. But you yeah. you wouldn't let them dominate you. You would look pretty normal from the outside, right? Well, if you were you know if you were under the guidance of a a morshid who you know uh, was directing you and not allowing you to fall into those uh, intoxicated states, um, you just remember Ibn Arabi also criticizes. You know, he says that you know the real state is the sobriety, but it's the sobriety where you actually then see the theophanies on a continual basis. And taste these theophanies. He used the, uses the metaphor of tasting, dok. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, that in the political realm, the sobriety has led many of these Sufis to make, um, alliances of convenience with the powers of the, of the time. And, you know, like I said, you know, Hafez criticizes this. Rumi criticizes this too. Um, and the Mutasawif in, in, in the writings of Mullah Satra is actually a trope of criticism, you know, so if someone is called a Mutasawwif, they are, you know, they are a Murid under, you know, they're basically blinded by the, by the teacher rather than the reality. Well, there's a discourse, um, yeah, among the non-Sufis who are suspicious of all Sufis because of this. They say, oh, the Sufis, they're promoting, uh, this non-involvement in politics or if not actually being compromised by associations with the evil powers. And, you know, it's so convenient for the powers that be to use Sufis to kind of neuter the call for uh, righteousness and justice that's at the heart yes. of Islam. Well, I mean, you can also look at it from this angle. I mean, a lot of Sufis themselves say this about the, the apolitical aspect of Sufism, but then you point out things to them, like, for example, 
Ibn Arabi's Tarjman al-Ashwaq, his interpreter of desire, that got him into a lot of trouble at the time in Egypt with the Fuqaha. This proves that, that everything that even the Sufis are doing is political. So, in a sense, Aristotle's dictum about uh, humanity being uh, a political animal is true. But the, the point of the exercise, as the Quran reminds us, is to temper that. You know, yes, we are political animals because we are social animals, but there has to be a tempering of that process rather than going from one extreme to the other extreme. Mm-hmm. So today, Sufism in the United States seems to be pretty conservative. Uh, Said Hussein Nasser is no yeah. exception to that rule. Uh, are, are there exceptions that you've seen? There, there are exceptions, mostly amongst well, individuals. Yeah, I think Charles in the Upton, area, there, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Charles Upton is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful example of this. Um, uh, I have tremendous respect for him, tremendous respect for his work. Um, there's Charles Upton, but there are also individuals, you know, people who are not very well known, um, that I've known who lived in the Bay Area, the San Francisco, Berkeley area. Um, but the establishment institutional Sufisms and particularly, um, you know, orders like the Naqshbandi Haqqaniya, uh, and also the Maryamiya, et cetera, they seem to be dominated by the agendas of the establishment itself, you know, so that basically these Turuk have become nothing more than outlets or the Islamic outlets of the establishment in the United States, unfortunately. Um, I think a lot of that is also because of a survival uh, impulse by these orders themselves, that if they are to survive in the environment of the United States as Muslims and as Sufis, that they somehow must do this. Um, I profoundly disagree with those decisions, but yeah, I think that's where they're coming from. Yeah, and I, I know uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Kabir Helminski seems to be a uh, he's, he's a very low key truther, I understand, and yeah, I've, I've run into fair, a few others. So there, it's a it's a real interesting spectrum uh, of you know and yeah. the uh, oh the boy now I'm, I'm spacing out the the name of the uh, the South African based order. Um, oh the, yes, the Badawi of, of yeah. Uh, Sheikh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you know, they have some very interesting political initiatives, especially the Umar Vadiya uh, initiative to bring back the gold dinar and silver dirham and replace yeah. the fiat usury currency. This, this Reba currency that, wow, talk about the scale of sins, you know, what the Quran has to say about usury. And then notice that every bit of currency in exchange is Reba currency. It's created as usury, as, as uh, interest bearing debt. My goodness. Um, you know, so, so hats off to those guys for, Going after that one. I mean, he's, Ian Dallas is 100% that capitalism is a system of Kofu for, for that very reason that you just put your finger on. Um, and so, you know, the question is, do we continue to play with this system or not? And if not, then what exactly is the world that we wish to create? Um, and so that is the dialogue and the conversation that I think that needs to happen. Um, and novelization, you know, I mean, we, you know, Novelization is the way to go. Hybridization is the way to go. Looking at everything, reading everything, you know, um, not taking every philosopher at their word, novelizing on even each of the philosophers and thinkers that one is reading and influenced by, uh, and not letting oneself be ossified by a single thought, moving, you know, moving in that uh, endless stream of, of, of thought, as it were. So as a leader of a Sufi order, how, how do you deal with, you know, preaching that that's what people should do, but with the, the, with the built-in structure that don't allow, don't people expect you to be their sheikh, that you, you know, they have to be the, the corpse in the hands of, of you? <laughs> I do think a little differently. Um, I think it is more important for people to be friends first, to be a community in the true sense of that word. Um, I don't want to impose any corporate structures on anybody. I refuse to do that. Um, you know, so I advise people as a friend you know, rather than as a sheikh. Um, and I think this is more important because if you are going to develop a relationship with a person uh, and to guide them spiritually, um, the onus is on you. Uh, you have a grave responsibility before man and God alike, you know, to treat these people with integrity. Uh, and this is a message that unfortunately seems to have uh, gone over a lot of people's head, not just Sufis, but, you know, various yoga masters and gurus and, and whatnot. So the age of abuse of people on a spiritual path must end. And the method to do that is that, you know, one has to become friends and family to these people that come one into one's orbit. Um, so you are 
not just their sheikh, but you are your, their, their friend. So the concern about their welfare, about their spiritual growth, uh, is, is something that is with you all the time, like you would treat a children. So, you know, a lot of the Sufis who keep quoting these passages about being a corpse in the hand of the washer forget to ask other pertinent questions about the other side of this, about responsibility to shame, or uh, the people that come in fear. Well, that's a great answer, but it's being drowned out by the bumper music. So, you know, we may have to take up this discussion again. Uh, it's been very, sure. very interesting. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Wahid well, Azal and Barakallah Hufi. Thank you for having me. Uh, God bless. Assalamu alaikum. It's uh, Wahid Azal. You're listening to Truth Jihad Radio. You can find links, uh, including links to his work, at the radio page. Go to truthjihad.com. Click on the radio show link. Find your way to this particular show broadcast April 3rd, and you'll find all the links. So until next week, uh, have a great week, and God bless.